For the first 60 years of its existence, Israel had a strategic nightmare. It was an island of scarcity. It was surrounded by neighbors who were floating on oceans of oil and gas, while Israel itself had nothing. Golda Meir, the former prime minister, once famously joked, let me tell you something that we Israelis have against Moses. He took us 40 years through the desert in order to bring us to the one spot in the Middle East that has no oil. This wasn't just a joke, it was a vulnerability. The nation relied entirely on imported coal and oil. In a region defined by conflict, relying on others for your power is a dangerous game. One blockade, one sanction, and the lights go out. But then, everything changed. In a span of just 15 years, Israel has pulled off one of the most rapid infrastructure transformations in history. They have built a grand structure, not a single building, but a $30 billion machine consisting of offshore titans, underground arteries, and desert canals. They discovered a monster energy reserve under the sea. They carved high-speed rail tunnels through holy mountains. They dug deep water ports that sparked a spy war between the US and China. And they are attempting to engineer a way to save the Dead Sea from evaporation. Today, we are going deep into the engineering, the politics, and the sheer audacity of these projects. This is the story of how a nation built its way out of scarcity, and in doing so, reshaped the balance of power in the Middle East. The transformation began with a discovery that geologists said was impossible. In 2010, deep seismic scans revealed a massive anomaly under the Mediterranean seabed. They drilled and they found Leviathan. Leviathan is a gas field of staggering proportions. 600 billion cubic meters of natural gas. It was enough to power Israel for 40 years. But finding it was the easy part. The field was located 130 kilometers offshore, under 1,500 meters of water, and then another few miles of rock. To get it out, they had to build a grand structure at sea. The Leviathan platform is a marvel of maritime engineering. It stands 10 kilometers offshore. It isn't floating. It is pinned to the seabed by massive steel legs called a jacket. The platform itself, the top side, weighs 25,000 tons. That's the weight of three Eiffel Towers. The construction logistics were planetary in scale. The top sides weren't built in Israel. They were fabricated in Texas, on the other side of the world. They had to be loaded onto the world's largest barges, sailed across the Atlantic, through the Strait of Gibraltar, and across the Mediterranean. Once they arrived, they were met by the Sleipnir, the largest crane vessel on Earth. In a delicate operation battling open ocean swells, the crane lifted the 25,000-ton deck and lowered it onto the legs with millimeter precision. If they had smashed it, billions of dollars and years of work would have sunk to the bottom. But this structure has a unique feature that most oil rigs don't have. Defense. Because this platform powers the entire nation, it is a prime military target. The platform is equipped with its own sensors and is protected by the Israeli Navy's specialized Sa'ar-6 corvettes, which carry the Sea Dome, a sea-based version of the Iron Dome missile defense system. It is a fortress at sea. Energy was the first pillar, trade was the second, and this brings us to the most controversial grand structure in Israel, the expansion of the Haifa port. Haifa is Israel's gateway to the world, but the old port was too shallow for the new generation of megaships. Israel needed an upgrade, but they didn't want to pay for it alone. So they opened a tender. And the winner was China. A state-owned Chinese company, SIPG, won the contract to build and operate the new Bay Port Terminal for 25 years. They brought in massive automated cranes, dredged the harbor to a depth of 17 meters, and installed a high-tech automated logistics system. From an engineering standpoint, it's a triumph. The port can now handle the largest ships afloat, boosting Israel's economy. 
But from a geopolitical standpoint, it was an earthquake. The U.S. Navy, whose sixth fleet often docks in Haifa, was furious. They were worried that a Chinese-run port sitting just meters away from U.S. warships could be used for surveillance or espionage. It forced Israel into a delicate diplomatic dance. They had to write special override clauses into the contract, allowing the Israeli government to seize control of the port instantly in an emergency. It's a stark reminder. In the world of grand structures, a port is never just a port. It's a foothold. While the sea was being conquered, engineers faced a different challenge on land. Topography. Connecting the coastal city of Tel Aviv to the mountain city of Jerusalem with a high-speed train seemed impossible. The elevation change is steep and the terrain is rugged. The solution was the A1 link, a 600-kilometer electrified rail network. But to keep the tracks flat enough for high speeds, they couldn't go over the mountains, they had to go through them. Engineers used massive tunnel boring machines, TBMs, to carve 38 kilometers of tunnels. Bridge number 10, the longest in Israel, stretches 1.2 kilometers over the Ailan Valley. But the crown jewel of this line is the destination, the Itzhak Navan station in Jerusalem. When you step off the train in Jerusalem, you are 80 meters, 260 feet, underground. It is one of the deepest heavy rail stations in the world. Why so deep? Partially for engineering reasons to enter the city beneath the existing buildings. But there is a secondary function. Like many structures in Israel, it is dual purpose. The station is designed to function as a massive nuclear-proof bunker capable of sheltering 2,000 people in the event of a war. The ventilation systems can filter out chemical weapons. It is a grand structure of transit built inside a grand structure of survival. Energy, trade, transport. Israel has solved these, but there is one grand structure that remains broken. The Red Sea Dead Sea Conveyance. The Dead Sea is an ecological wonder, the lowest place on Earth but it is disappearing. Diversion of water from the Jordan River means the sea level drops by over a meter every year. Sinkholes are swallowing roads and resorts. The sea is literally vanishing. The proposed solution is arguably the most ambitious engineering project in the Middle East, a 180-kilometer pipeline that would pump water from the Red Sea carry it across the desert borders of Jordan and Israel and dump it into the Dead Sea. It sounds like the perfect win-win, but here the engineering hit a wall of chemistry. Scientists discovered that mixing the sulfate-rich water of the Red Sea with the calcium-rich water of the Dead Sea creates gypsum. If they proceeded, the beautiful blue Dead Sea could turn milky white or worse, trigger a massive bloom of red algae. Combined with political tensions between Israel and Jordan, the project is currently stalled, a grand structure that exists on paper, but whose reality is trapped in a bureaucratic and chemical deadlock. Finally, we have to ask, what was all this for? Why spend $30 billion? The answer lies in Ashkelon. Because of the gas from Leviathan, Israel has developed a massive petrochemical industry. They are turning that gas into plastic polymers, exporting $2 billion worth of materials a year. But the real game changer is gas diplomacy. Israel is now exporting gas to its neighbors, Egypt and Jordan. Think about the history of this region. For decades, these nations were at war. Now, their power grids are physically linked. Jordan's lights stay on because of Israel's gas. Egypt's LNG terminals process Israel's gas for export to Europe. 
This is the ultimate goal of these grand structures. It is infrastructure peace. It is the idea that if you are trading billions of dollars of energy and water, you are less likely to fire missiles at each other. It is a concrete web of interdependence. Israel's transformation is a lesson in sheer force of will. In less than a generation, they engineered themselves out of an existential crisis. They turned scarcity into surplus. But grand structures are never just about concrete. The railway sparked land battles. The port sparked a superpower rivalry. The gas rigs require a navy to defend them. And the Dead Sea Canal remains a dream. These projects prove that you can build your way to power. But they also remind us that in the Middle East, every new pipe, every new track, and every new port is a move on a four-dimensional chessboard of geology, politics, and war. What do you think? Is infrastructure peace a real possibility or just a fantasy? And is the environmental risk of the Dead Sea Canal worth it? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this deep dive, make sure to subscribe to Grand Structures.